Thank you, Nathan. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Nathan and uh, organizers uh, for inviting me and also for this wonderful um, initiative, I would say. Um, everything comes with something good always is a Indian saying that uh, the pandemic, of course, is terrible for the whole world, but it has uh, at least made um, us to have um, our small um, communications um, in a much wider sense. Uh, so, so I have never been um, to Australia, but I'm uh, really happy that I could uh, speak to all of you and uh, talk about um, the work we are doing. Um, so now what I'm going to talk today is uh, a collection of work with uh, myself, with uh, my former student, uh, Deblina, and recently uh, many others have uh, started looking at, and in particular, Saranti Janssen. So I've given a title which is uh, perhaps not very descriptive, but it has three um, important um, processes. The one I call random recursive tree, one is branching Markov chains and R models. So what I'm going to do is I will try to show you that they are all related. And once one see that they are related, a lot of classical results comes in, uh, can be done quickly, and many uh, new results also can be discovered. Um, so to begin with, the, these are my quarters for the talk uh, today. Uh, Deblina, she's currently in Durham University, but physically in Copenhagen. This shows how the world is becoming small. Savante, of course, is in um, Uppsala in Sweden. Um, and I'm going to cover the talk based on uh, four uh, papers which we have written together. Uh, they're all jointly with Deblina and the last one with uh, Savante as well. They're all available um, from the archive. Now here is a schematic of the talk. There are a lot of things in here. I will try to give the big picture the most importance. The others I will uh, tell you not much of the details, but the statements. So what I'm going to start with is uh, two reinforcement models, uh, very simple, and uh, I will uh, connect them to classical examples of ARN and um, some strange ARN models which have been looked into the literature but not necessarily uh, a lot in the probability literature and we'll also uh, set our main goal. And then we will um, talk about this uh, connection between the two different uh, processes, the random recursive tree and branching Markov chain, and I'll show you that that essentially leads to polyotype R models, which we call the representation theorem, which I will um, state in full generality. And then rest of the talk would essentially be to use this theorem to derive uh, some of the classical results as well as some new results. And finally, I'll end with uh, a, this recent work with Deblina and Savante, which uh, covers the, something which we, uh, we always expected, but turned out to be much more difficult than what we initially thought. All right, so here are two examples which I'm going to start with as two very simple reinforced uh, models. One I call a simple aggregation model and a simple combinatorial point process. Now the first one is, uh, I will show you a kind of a simulation, which is a very low tech simulation, but what is the process? So we have particles, say sitting on the positive, non-negative half line from zero, one, two, et cetera. These are the locations where particles can be placed. Each location can have more than one particle or none, and it, the process evolves in the following way, that we start with one particle at the position zero, just one at zero, and at the time is discrete, and at the 
and at time we select a site uh, proportional to the number of particles in the uh, all the sites present. So if a particle is a site has no particle, then that's not part of the selection. So because we are starting with only one particle at zero, this is perfectly defined model for every n, and essentially it's just selecting a particle uniformly at random. That would do the same same job. So once a random site, say J, is selected, then what we do is that we add a particle at the site J plus one. So occasionally, it will explore a new domain. Uh, now, just up to this much, I think we can think about it in a very simple one-dimensional toy model of our epidemic spread also, that in general, an epidemic will have more possibility of spreading where there is a large concentration. So that's the selection of the site and it propagates to the next one and occasionally it creates a new epidemic. Now this is really not a very good um, uh, model for when uh, epidemic uh, study because uh, epidemic networks are far more complicated, but this can be a very uh, important model for studying, say, amoebiotic infection in our gut, when it's really one dimensional and amoebiotic infections really spread inside the gut by um, um, the biological process of a one uh, cell splitting into two and finds a new, new place if uh, possible. Uh, however, please note that this is a, a growing model. It's an aggregation model. Uh, there is no killing here. So this very, uh, I call it a biological model, uh, is a, uh, as I was saying, it's a one dimensional amoeba colony formation without any predator and without any chemical intervention. Um, so this is one thing I would like you to notice that there is a new location should be explored and hence potentially the growth can be infinity at the limit of course, not at any finite end. Now here is the low tech simulation. So what I have done is essentially uh, that simulated this process and I'm going to show you pictures of these uh, lines, vertical lines, which are the density of the, of the particles after few iterations. So this is at the iteration 10. So initially I'm doing plotting every 10 iterations. Soon, I think I will move on to every 100 iterations because the process doesn't move that fast. So let me do it as a movie. Hopefully it will work. So you see it kind of moved slowly towards the right and it's, it, now, now I'm doing, I think, yeah, 1000 after each 1000 iteration. So you can see that how slow the movement of the process and it seems to be settling down to the bell-shaped curve but it's still moving. Right, so I've only done up to 10, uh, well, 100,000, right? So now you see here, uh, I have just done a, a statistical fitting of this uh, uh, vertical lines, and it fits the normal distribution perfectly fine. So it seems that it should be are normally distributed, but what is the mean and what is the variance? Considering that it moved to the right, it should have a drift, and, uh, and the spread, of course, you can't see from this uh, picture. So what is a rigorous proof is the question, and, uh, and to find the centering and the scaling, for example. Here is a completely different model, okay? Uh, jumping to a completely different thing. I call it a combinatorial point process. So you consider a sequence of uh, randomly growing finite trees. So this is of this type that at the beginning, we start with only one vertex, we'll call it the root. And at each discrete time, a new vertex comes and joins uniformly at random to one of the existing particles. This is a very well-studied process. Uh, in probability literature, as well as in uh, computer science and various networking uh, study, uh, we call, and also in random algorithm, uh, 
So this is uh, in general known as random recursive tree, sometimes also called uniform random recursive tree. So, so when the tree has capital N many vertices, it is same as selecting one tree uniformly at random from the set of all level rooted trees on N vertices. So, so this is uniform tree or uniform random recursive tree, sometimes they say. Now, if I denote it by Tn to be the tree, the question which I'm asking is the following. Uh, maybe it becomes easier if I show you a picture. So here is the picture. So, so this is the random recursive tree here, and this is my root, which I denoted by minus one, we'll see that why that is the case. Now, if I remove the root, then the tree will split into a forest, which are all little, little trees uh, rooted at the children of the original root. Now, because of the process essentially is similar, so each one of them would be a random recursive tree on its own right. However, the question which I'm asking is that what is this, uh, the sizes of them? Of course, there are finitely many of them and they are always can be counted but as we grow, it is very simple to see that the number of children would be growing and in fact would be growing at a logarithmic rate because of this uniform uh, uh, process of joining. It's really like a coupon collector's problem. So now we can do the following uh, type of, a, um, I would say, a process of keeping good statistics that, okay, it might be very difficult to keep the count of all of them. So we can do the following. We decide that we will color it either green or red by tossing a coin. Green with some probability P, red with some probability one minus P. And then we count the total number of red colors and the total number of green colors. They are essentially a function of each other, a linear function because the total number of vertices is something which is say little n or capital N is what we said. So what is the distribution of that? Now, if I say it in this way, then it perhaps becomes more intuitive that maybe it has something to do with the R because we are selecting one vertex uniformly at random and joining something. So in this coloring scheme, it really starts looking like a polia, uh, polia process. So these are two examples we'll keep in mind. And um, uh, so this is the remark that it really has something to do with uh, poly R. But what if we color in many more? Of course, if we do finitely many, then we can think about doing uh, finitely many uh, color poly R, uh, not just two colors. But what if we think of doing it uh, much more than just finitely many? Maybe countable infinite or maybe even more. Because if we do even more, perhaps then we can keep the entire statistics of this point process of the sizes of the subtrees. Uh, if we think about the colors being, say, never getting replicated, now it's, then it sounds a little uneasy because we don't even understand what it really means that the colors are not getting replicated. But we'll try to form a framework for that. So if we come back to the simple aggregation model, this also can be viewed as an R model, but with possibly infinitely many colors. So here the colors are the sites, uh, which we denote say 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera. And we start the process with only one ball of color zero. And then when selecting a site proportional to the uh, number of particles there is seen as selecting a uh, ball uniformly at random from the arm, which has some color, which is now the size. And placing a ball, uh, if the selected size is J, that means selected color is J, we are going to replace it with a new color, which is J plus one. Putting back, of course, the ball which we have selected. So it really looks like a, a arm model, but now, matrix is what they say in the R model case, it's slightly different. It's like the right shift operator, right? So the, if the matrix form, it really looks like that zero goes to one, one goes to two, etc. 
So if the, the everything is zero, the diagonal is also zero, the one upper uh, diagonal is one and everything else is zero. And it's in the infinite matrix now because there is a potential that new colors would be added in. And of course, the question is that what is the limiting distribution? Now, the classical example, I think I don't need to tell this community that uh, in nine, uh, 1920, Polyer seminal work is about uh, on with two uh, colors, red and green. You select a ball uniformly at random, you check its color. If it is green, you put a green ball. <clears throat> if it is red, you put a red ball in. And of course, uh, Polyer's uh, famous work where he showed that there is a almost sure uh, limit and the limiting random variable has a beta distribution. And the distribution may depend on the initial config configuration which we started with. So the configuration forms a mark of chain, but it's really not ergodic. It never forgets the initial configuration. And this got, of course, generalized uh, in a lot of way in the literature for last 100 years now with uh, various people, I call it just Polia, Egenbargen, and Friedman. They essentially uh, talked about the following type of a general scheme, if we call it, that we have some finite set of colors, say red, green, blue, yellow, etc. There is a matrix which is uh, indexed by the colors. And it really says that if you selected a red ball, then the red row would tell me how many reds to be replaced, how many greens to be replaced, how many blues to be replaced, etc. And then the R configuration at a n plus one at time point is nothing but the one is at n at time point added with this replacement given. So that's the classical, classical finite color R model. Now, one thing is slightly uh, important here, and that the only thing we will be considering in this talk is what they call the balanced arm scheme. Now, whatever may be written here, I'll just go back to this uh, schematic, that the balance really means that each row sum is constant, which in other words, when we come to this description of the arm process, it means that I don't know how many of each color may have been added, but I know exactly deterministically that how many total number of balls has been placed. There is no randomness there, it's constant. And once that is the thing, it's customary to write this replacement matrix, not as number counts, but as a proportion count. So what they do, they divide by the row total which is constant across the rows. So if you divide by the row total, then the, now it, the replacement matrix would become a stochastic matrix because there is all these entries are non-negative and now each row will be summed up to one. So this row normalized one automatically makes the replacement matrix a stochastic matrix and hence artificially we can associate a Markov chain with it. And what has been, uh, observed that there is a strange influence of the associated Markov chain, which a priori has no reason to have any meaning in the context of the ARM process. So for example, it is known in the classical literature that the asymptotic properties of a balanced ARM depends qualitatively on the properties of the associated Markov chain, such as irreducibility, for example. And the limit also depends on the associated stationary distribution of this finite state chain now in the classical setup. Of course, if it exists. Uh, so in other words, I would say that the asymptotic properties of a balanced arm depend on the associated Markov chain and its qualitative um, or asymptotic properties uh, determines the asymptotic of the arm uh, but why is it true? This is absolutely not apparent from the classical literature on ARN, the mainly because it's really just a formal relation in how it has been observed. Or, uh, so our contention is that there must be something more to it. Now, the reason that uh, 
it is not clear in the classical literature is mainly because the arm models then get studied by three main techniques. One is a heavy use of algebraic techniques where they use uh, Peron Frobenius theorem and Jordan canonical form. These two are main tool to uh, consider the replacement matrix as an algebraic object and the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors and their properties kind of determines the asymptotic limit. So these kind of ideas started from Krishna Atreya's PhD work and uh, remain in the literature even today. And they are very powerful uh, methods. Uh, however, they in many ways lack some kind of a probabilistic interpretation is what I will say that uh, why the replacement matrix being artificially made a uh, stochastic matrix should have an impact on the, on the properties of the, of the arm. So what is our main goal? We would like to study the arm models with infinitely many colors. We will establish a deeper connection between a balanced arm model and the associated Markov chain. And this will help us to study the asymptotic properties of a balanced arm without using algebraic techniques such as Perron Frobenius theorem and Jordan canonical form. And uh, we must do that if we want to do it with the infinite colors because these kind of theorems are, uh, there are some versions of them in the operator um, algebra. However, they are unsatisfactory. They are not as good as like the way uh, they work for finite finite uh, uh, dimension. And uh, then I guess if we can do that, then probably we will be able to study the infinite color um, ARM processes and hence going back to the simple um, models which we started with. Right, so another thing I made a key word here that it will be easier. Now easier or harder is always uh, um, matter of taste and matter of culture, I guess. Uh, so obviously algebraic techniques would be much easier to algebraize, uh, but to the probabilist, perhaps a probabilistic technique would be much easier to um, understand. Okay, so now let me spend a few slides to give you the general uh, construction of an arm, and now not just on finite colors. So what we are going to do, we are going to really look at this as a process, measure value process on, uh, on a Polish space. Now, even this Polish space, to tell you the truth, is not necessary. There is only one place we need it, but for the talk, I'm just going to take it as a Polish space because majority of the examples are really uh, as a Polish space. Uh, we can always think them as a Polish space. So, and we will assume that the Polish space is embedded inside a uh, uh, finite dimensional Euclidean space, and we endow it with the corresponding um, Borel sigma algebra. As I said, that it can be further generalized, but for the talk, we'll restrict to this one so that technical difficulties does not pop up. Um, and uh, we'll uh, look into the, the ARM process as a measure value process on the set of finite measures, which will denote by this script M. And we, if we can normalize, then it would be a, a probability measure. So PS would denote the set of all probability measure on this uh, police space. And the replacement metric we will be considering balanced on and hence we will consider it as a mark of Carnot on this Polish space. So it would be a um, function, of course, from the Polish space along with its uh, um, sigma algebra to zero one. So each row in some sense would represent a move by this mark of Carnot. So our probability given where it sits, how to move from there is what this mark of Carnal would essentially tell us. And that would we consider it as a replacement scheme. And what is the process then? The process is described, we will call it UN. 
the measure value process and it described in the following way that if Zn represents the randomly chosen color, now please note that this is slightly different than the general understanding of ARN where we select a ball. Now we are not going to select a ball at all. The final reason of selecting a ball is to note down the color. And the color distribution in a classical ARN is proportional to the configuration of the existing ARN. And that's what we are going to uh, take as a definition here that if Gn represents a randomly chosen color, then at the n plus one and to draw, the conditional distribution of Gn, Gn given the path, is the configuration of the current R, which is we are going to denote by Un. And because we are going, doing it on a poly space, so I'm using this uh, notation ds. Now for a finite or a countable case, these are essentially probability mass functions. Otherwise, we need to understand them as probability measure. And uh, what is the driving process? The driving process is once we have selected the color Zn, the new configuration is the old configuration plus whatever is to be replaced is by the mask of kernel. Now, because these are uh, measure value processes now, so I'm looking at it as a measure on finite measure on the sigma algebra, the natural sigma algebra on uh, the poly spaces. And now, of course, we can explicitly calculate this proportionality constant in this case because it's a mark of kernel. So, and each time that means it seems that the total amount we are adding is just one. And if we start with one, so we, if we start with u0, which is a probability measure, which will be an assumption in this uh, talk, it can be generalized, but to keep matters simple, we will start with a probability measure. So the total mass at for Zn is n plus one. Hence, the exact conditional probability is just un by n plus one. And we will refer the process UN as the R model with color indexed by this poly space S, which can be potentially infinite, with initial configuration U0 and replacement kernel R. And we'll call something a random configuration uh, will be the UN by N plus one, which is a random probability on and in fact, what we just now say, saw that this is exactly the conditional distribution of the n plus one x selected color given the existing configuration of the arm and the path. Now the path does not depend here. It only depends on the existing configuration. So, Right, so that's the conditional distribution and we will sometime denote it by Pn and please note that Pn is a random probability. Itself is a probability and the probability is random. And the expected configuration of course is nothing but the expectation of it. And if, if we go by the usual uh, standard thing of uh, almost classical probability that if I take an expectation of a conditional distribution, I get the marginal distribution. So that's what it happens, that the expected configuration is the marginal probability of the n plus one at selected color. Uh, model includes entire class, all the classical examples, polia and all others. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So because I thought that they, I got a message that my internet is, uh, yeah, but I, uh, good. So the only possible uh, lack of generality is because of the assumption that we said, uh, let me go back uh, over here, that U0, the starting configuration is a probability measure. That's a little lack of generality, but as I said, this is just for this talk. This can be made more general, which are available in the paper. So, and that can be easily taken care. 
but it actually includes much more and something which was looked into long time back uh, in 1973 that was i think the second berkeley symposium where uh, this uh, model was introduced by uh, david blackwell and mckean uh, and what they said at that time they gave it a name which in statistics is known as Ferguson distribution and nowadays the Bayesian people calls it a Dirichlet process prior and what does it do is that you take any poly space and you do the driving of the arm as that you reinforce the same color so in the uh, in this uh, measure way you add that the Dirac measure at the random observed color uh, Zn. This was introduced by uh, uh, Blackwell and Ferguson, and it's in fact part of Ferguson's PhD thesis and later work by Blackwell and McKean. And they showed that there is a limit, and the limit is what they call uh, initially Ferguson distribution, but nowadays it is more known as. Dirichlet process prior has become over the years a major tool in the study of non-parametric base type approach. Okay, so now those are all examples we talked about. I talked about uh, general structure and now what I'm going to uh, do is that I'm going to um, do a change of gear. I'm going to tell you a pictorial description of a process which is a mark of chain, but not in quite, it would may branch. And finally, we'll show you that is really nothing but the arm. So what I'm do, I'm going to start with one vertex, but the time hasn't started yet, okay? So um, it's very simple to understand this in the Indian philosophy, but maybe very difficult otherwise, that's it before the beginning of the time. There is uh, something, which we call minus one, uh, because the time will start at zero. And this particular guy is uh, strange and we're not going to touch it at all. Now the time starts, a new vertex comes, we call it zero. It has no other option than to join to this uh, so-called originator before the time started and it joins there. And the next one comes, we'll call it one. Now it has more than one choice and it will decide it in some way. I make it fair with probability half and half. It joins to somewhere. Say for in this case, it joined it uh, to the originator minus one. And we let this go on. The next one comes, we denoted by two at the time two. It has three choices. Being fair can join to any one of them, maybe join to this one and so on and so forth. Naturally, what I'm doing is nothing but random recursive tree. But now indexed in a slightly strange way that the root is minus one, there is a zero vertex, one vertex, etc. Okay, so this may be the uh, particular sample of it. Now what I do that once I have done this, I'm now going to, um, so by the way, I had these little probabilities written to remind us that these links has been formed with such probabilities. This is our just a sample of that. Now on this structure, I'm going to have a chain running. And the way it is done is the following, that little schematic here, that my nothing color can color red and green say with some probability P and one minus P. But if I have a color green, then it may happen with some possibly other probability, which I write A and one minus A, A for green, one minus A for red. And if it is a red, then it will have probability say one minus B and B, B for red and one minus B for green. So for example, I'm, uh, this is just a um, 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 sample that may be zero when it is colored, it's to be colored with probability P green and probability one minus P red. Why? Because it has joined to this no color thing. This guy is not to be not going to be touched. It gives it a color with some probability. Maybe it gave it zero. Now one has also joined to this no uh, color thing and hence would be colored according to these probabilities. Maybe it was colored red. Now two has joined to red. 
So two will be colored according to the prescription given under red. So it might be red with probability B or pro with probability one minus B, it may be green. Maybe it turn out to be red and we continue like this. Now three again is joined to a red and hence we'll get this prescription. So let uh, so I just um, drew this in some random fashion. And now if I look at a path, what is this? If I forget everything else and look at just this path, then this is nothing but a mark of chain where this prescription here is my driving mark of uh, matrix, the stochastic matrix. And this prescription here is my initial distribution. So this guy has been colored according to this prescription. After this has been colored, anything here would be colored by based on the state of this, which in this particular example is red. Now this guy is colored according to the prescription of the state of this, which also happens to be red, etc. So this is a chain on red and blue state when I look at this part. However, we should not, for, oh, by the way, just to emphasize this, I write these uh, letters to say that this has been colored by this U0, which is this prescription I call, and this is the prescription I now call the matrix R. However, we should not forget that sometimes there are branches. Now, what happens to the branches? Of course, if I look at this part, then that itself is a mark of chain, but when these two chains parted here, they have nothing in common. So this guy will be colored only based on the state here, has nothing to do with what happened here or what happened up there. So what do we get in totality? We get a branching mark of chain. Okay, this is simple to understand, I guess. Now suppose I do this very strange thing that I decided to remove the links. So I created the links first, did this coloring, and now I'm saying, okay, I erase the rings. I'm not going to give you the data about the links. However, I am going to give you the data as the colors as they appear. Now, if we see that, then of course the backbone is now lost. We can perhaps get it back by, uh, I don't know, by, thinking of how to reconnect. And then I should not forget that the connections were made by various different probabilities. And these probabilities are becoming linearly small. All right, what is my, so, so what is, uh, what I'm drawing here is that the links which I have erased, I don't know them now. So there is a possibly, Statistically, we can perhaps try to find them, predict them, but they, if they don't exist, and I ask the question that they don't exist, I don't give you, what is the distribution of the color Zn given everything before? Let us try to calculate that. This is very simple calculation. Okay, so Zn must have been connected to somewhere before where there are n plus one possibilities. So it must be, it could have been connected to U0, then, or sorry, in minus one, and then it would be connect, colored by U0. Or it could have been connected to the zero at vertex, which has color Z0, and hence, then it should be connect, colored by the Markov kernel at Z0, and so on and so forth. So if I do it, this, this is that simple, and then if I rewrite that the distribution of color Zn times n plus one, then it becomes a big sum. And that can be easily written as that big sum is its previous one plus the replacement at Zn, which is the process I described as R model. So what I'm telling you is that the recursive, random recursive tree and the branching Markov chain on it together gives me a balanced R model. But the converse is also true by the same picture. 
that from a balanced R model, I can reconstruct these two. Okay. Uh, so together we have this schematic. Now there is something I have done here deliberately so that we don't get confused uh, uh, for the later part. That I'm not going to call them Z. I'm going to call them W. That the Markov chain which is on this uh, random recursive tree, which we'll call it WN, and the color selected from a balanced Markov chain, I'll call it ZN. And what we have been describing really is that the entire process WN and the entire process ZN are same in distribution. What I constructed to it for you is really a kind of a cohort representation proof of that. I am really doing an almost sure equality there, but that is in general need not be the case. You might be doing your R in some, as Krishna Atriya would say, in the next room, and I might be doing my um, uh, random recursive tree and branching mark of chain in this room, or maybe you are doing it in Australia, I'm doing it in India. They may be totally different as observations, but as processes, they are safe. And that is what is, uh, okay, so this is just a definition of the random recursive tree. I'll uh, skip that. Uh, I'll tell you uh, formally what is the branching Markov chain we are looking at. So we will take a symbol delta, which is the colorlessness, okay, of the root. So, which is not part of the color set. And the process of W is of the following type, that if the head, so, so N, uh, reverse arrow would denote the nth vertex parent. If the parent of the nth vertex is the originator, then it would be colored according to the initial configuration U0. Otherwise, it is colored according to the Markov kernel sitting at the parent color. And that's how the WN process is. Uh, that's the mar branching Markov chain on the random recursive tree. And it has a new uh, driving uh, kernel, we can say, that when it is the colorlessness, then it is U0, otherwise it is the original mark of kernel. And what we call the grand representation theorem is that you do the R model if you can and call the colors to be ZN and you call the, um, this branching mark of chain WN, they have the same distribution. And in fact, this proof is very simple. It's just a trivial inductive proof of exactly the schematic uh, um, diagram of the uh, low-tech movie I showed you. Okay. Um, this is, uh, we will come back to it when we need. So now here is a, what we call the marginal representation theorem. This is more a working theorem that if we really want not to look into the entire process, but we want to look at only the selected color at the n plus one is draw, which you call it Zn, then that now can be obtained as a mark of chain stopped at a random time. Let me try to explain this to you from the, from the picture right here. So, if I look at this chain, which is up to the nth, nth vertex, how much is the path? Well, let's call it tau n, right? That's the path length from the nth vertex to the root. There's a unique path. And this chain here is really determining the color of the nth vertex. I mean, determining in the sense of distribution. So that is what is the marginal representation theorem really saying that, that the nth color or the n plus one is color technically because we're starting from minus one, that n plus one is color is a mark of change stopped at this tau n. Now if the change can be running independent of the um, this random recursive tree, because that, as I pointed out to you, that the random recursive tree is first constructed and then the chain is constructed on it. 
and how much is the depth now this is a very simple calculation it's almost like an undergraduate probability that tau well is sum of these bernoulli variables that whether it joins or not joins and each joining probability is linearly decaying so tau n will have a scaling log n and in fact tau n by log n converges to one almost surely and it further has a neat uh, central limit theorem that when uh, centered by log n and scaled by square root of log n it goes to normal uh, zero one distribution so in a finite case it has a very similarity with a poisson distribution in fact but with a parameter which is log n so that's why this uh, uh, normal distribution is coming this is really like a coupon collector's problem uh, i'll skip this through because this is exactly what we talked about now one thing i would really like to point out here that the zn as a process is not x tau n as a process x tau n is a simplistic one because tau n's are independent of the markov chain and hence x tau n itself will be a markov chain and zn is not a markov chain okay that's a problem of our model in general okay so now some general asymptotic let me tell you and for that i would um, um, need an assumption this assumption is needed for certain uh, um, examples a lot of good examples um, and um, here is the assumption that my mark of underlying mark of chain satisfy a scale uh, a centered scale limit so some non random distribution lambda is there and a scaling uh, of a uh, sorry a scaling of bn and a centering of an with respect to some uh, constant uh, uh, drift v so quickly this assumption uh, are satisfied by a very large class of markov chains as we all know perhaps uh, it essentially i would say it call it ergodic uh, ergodic because this assumption is saying that for any initial um, distribution for the chain we have this uh, centered scale limit and a limit does not depend on any initial distribution um, so in some sense every irreducible chain uh, should satisfy that in fact it is very hard to get an example when it doesn't get satisfied and um, and it trivially holds when the random matrix is irreducible aperiodic and um, on a countable state space that's the classical result when there will need be no centering no scaling the chain itself will convert uh, and it also holds for null recurrent and transient cases uh, however it doesn't hold for the classical polya case and also the blackwell machine arm now what happens to the classical polya and the blackwell machine if you remember the classical polya is a diagonal matrix so if you think it as a chain the chain never moves so every state just reinforces itself same is with the blackwell machine it is reinforcing as a direct delta measure of the observed color so these in some sense i would say completely reducible chain so that then they are of a different kind and we don't get this ergodic behavior of course hey antar um, just to let you know like you probably have five more minutes okay okay i'll just um, uh, show you a few results and then uh, stop and take questions right so okay let me skip this uh, let uh, this result is uh, too complicated to understand in some sense but just to display it that with the properties of the random recursive tree and uh, knowing about this assumption on the chain we can actually now derive uh, a limit weak limit of the um, arm process of the configured random configuration of the arm and these are various different scaling which leads to there and the one interesting case is really when there is a non trivial scaling and we get a something different in the limit than the limit which is there from the classical um, uh, markov chain thing okay so how, 
and that has a manifestation at the level of the marginal distribution of CN. But how do they look into some of the new art? Oh, by the way, before I move, I, let me point out that while we were working, uh, another group in, uh, in France and uh, England were working and they also have similar, similar results. And, and I think there are, uh, uh, they have now also discovered uh, many interesting results uh, in, the, in this uh, uh, type of uh, model. Okay, now let us uh, look into, uh, let me forget about these uh, unnecessary details because this is really a probability community here. So here is an interesting result that the uh, model we started with uh, that we get to move to the next one can be now uh, discovered as a uh, rigorous one that suppose I now have a random walk which is uh, with the replacement matrix is given by the uh, transition kernel of the random walk, then we will get the normal limit. And this is mainly only because of the central limit theorem and nothing else. The only one thing I would like to point out that the, this partial matrix of the limit is not the classical central limit theorem dispersion matrix. It is the non-centered dispersion. So it's not a variance, but it's a non-centered uh, second moment. And the one which we started with, the simple aggregation model, it really is uh, starting with one particle at zero and the right shift is that each chain just moves to the next. And that will have a log n centering and square root of log n uh, dispersion leading to normal zero one distribution. Uh, let me forget about this proof of this. So one can do it in general on d-dimensional lattice as well. And recently these limits has been done more general by we only get weekly in probability. Savante has been able to prove that that uh, can be done with almost surely also. Um, so while proving this result, we discovered this very interesting identity that the Euler constant gamma is alternating sum of the zeta k and uh, divided by k. And we really were puzzled that wow, why should this number theoretic result will be true? And we asked many number theories, none of them could tell us that this is known. So then we really searched hard and we figured that no other than uh, Euler himself proved this beautiful result in uh, 1734, long time back, of course and um, using his uh, fantastic work on the expansion of the gamma function. So uh, of course, no one expects us number theoretic results coming from um, proving central limit theorem. So that's fine, but we also <laughs> thought that this is quite interesting. So now, uh, finally, let me just uh, display to you the work with uh, uh, Cervante. So we have now a strong convergence result for the one which we could never do earlier that uh, suppose my replacement is um, irreducible, aperiodic, and positive regrets. Then we could show that irrespective of um, the finite or countably infinite, we will have a limit which is the stationary distribution. And, uh, but we assume that the uh, replacement matrix or the underlying chain would be strongly, strongly ergodic. Now strongly ergodic means it has a geometric uh, convergence, but the convergence uh, rate does not depend on, uh, the constants does not depend on, uh, on the initial distribution. So this is our conjecture and I'll probably stop here that for any irreducible aperiodic positive recurrent uh, chain, which we have unfortunately uh, not been able to prove. But uh, it seems that deriving a counter example is, uh, is equally, equally hard. Uh, I don't have time to tell you this, but one can also derive the simple combinatorial uh, point process limit, it uh, happens to be a uh, Dirichlet process prior limit, which was already absorbed by statisticians in a different context uh, much earlier 
uh, sometime into uh, early early uh, this century or actually late last century all right and uh, there are some statistics one can do but more interestingly is to do the unbalanced arm which is an open problem for everyone to try so thanks a lot